Be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Now I'm going to share very briefly this morning on the power of thanksgiving, the mysterious power of thanksgiving. And after that, we are going to, you know, spend some time to give thanks to God. I want you to realize that um, being a Christian is a very interesting thing. And if you really want to be a successful Christian, then you need to understand what it takes to be a successful Christian and what Christianity is all about. The Bible tells us something in the book of Revelation chapter 5. I want us to look at it. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. The scripture tells us this, that he has made us unto our God kings and priests. Everybody say kings and priests. Do you see that? Can we read this together out loud? One to go. And kings. Oh, they changed the translation. Okay, let's read this one. It's still the same thing. And you have caused to become a kingdom of our God. And okay, I, I, I like King James better. So let's have it in King James. Um, King James says, and has made us, let's read this, one to go. And has made us unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Somebody say, I am a king, and I am a priest. So, you are sitting beside a king today. You are sitting beside uh, a priest today. Amen. There are no coins, sorry. Because I know some of you will say, I'm, I'm a coin. No. <laughs> Sorry, there are no queens. Kings. Everybody say kings and priests. Say that one more time. Say that one more time. Now, when are we going to become kings and priests? When? Who knows when? Eh? When is it going to happen? Has it happened? I said, has it happened? The Bible said he has what? He has made us. Now, can you be bold about it? And say, I am a king and I'm a priest unto God. Wow. Now, how many of you come naturally? You come from a royal family. Naturally. Your father is a king, earthly king now. Or, uh, you know, you have some royalty. Anybody? You, you do? Okay, how many of you actually lived in a king's palace? Okay, I reckon not, you know, yeah. I'm talking about if you actually lived in a king's palace. Okay, you, so you observe the protocols of kingdom and rulership and how things are done in the palace. You will notice that there is a lot of honor that is attached to the throne. Isn't it? A lot of honor, a lot of regard, a lot of respect. I remember one of our brothers who, you know, was a prince, came from a royal family, later gave his life to Christ. He said, anytime he goes home, he was in uni, and anytime he goes back home, and maybe he looked disturbed or something, he said his father would be agitated. He said his father would be shaken. And his father would call him by his name and say, what's wrong? What's wrong? Is there a problem? What's wrong? Why are you like this? And he said, Dad, I'm okay. He said, no, 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 no. You are a prince. You, you, should not look, you should not look morose. He said, what do you want? You need girls? You need girls? I mean, that's the time because they weren't saved. So the father, could, the father could order 10 girls to be with him just for the weekend. So you want to go and spend the weekend in England? What do you want? There's a lot of power and royalty attached to the throne. Now, we are kings and priests unto God because our father is the king of kings and lord of lords. And I wonder how many kings are here this morning that are not reigning. How many kings are seated here this morning 
who are not sitting on their thrones and taking their rightful places in God. The reason is because we need to understand that rulership and kingship stands on two legs. And we see it here. Kings, one leg. Priest, one leg. Are you getting this? Now you need to stand on both legs. In order for you to reign as a king, you must function as a priest. Now I want you to help me to preach that to somebody this morning. Say, in order for you to reign as a king, you must function as a priest. Now, you see, let me talk a bit about king. You see, all of us like the things that go with being a king. The respect, the dominion, the wealth. Ah, and kings, if you came from my country, eh? And from my tribe, oh my God, those kings were bad. <laughs> oh my goodness. They, I mean, they, <laughs> they chop life. Beyond measure. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because, you know, a king rules auto autocratically. Autocracy. Okay. He doesn't rule by democracy. He doesn't consult you for anything. He takes his decisions. In fact, if he looks at your wife and thinks your wife is good, <laughs> and there are kings who have done that, who will just take somebody else's wife. And they are unquestionable. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, so there's a lot of power that goes with kingship. A lot of dominion. And also a lot of wealth. Back in the days, all the land in a region that is the domain of a king belonged to him. He owns the land. The king owns the land. So the king could look at you and say, I give you those five acres of land over there. So there's a lot of wealth. A lot of dominion, a lot of power, a lot of honor that goes with kingship. And how many of us like those things that go with kingship? In your life as a child of God, you want to see dominion. How many of you want to see dominion in your lives? You want to see dominion? Now, God doesn't call you to dominate people. No, that's not. we are not called to dominate people. We are called to dominate circumstances and situations of life. Are you getting what I'm saying? You, you are called to dominate space, time, and matter. Anybody that wants to succeed in life must literally gain dominion over space, over time, over matter. Now, you are called to dominate. You, you are called to possess. You are called to have the power to get wealth. How many of you like that? Power to get wealth. Wow. We like everything that goes with kingdom. Kingdom means that any realm of life where God places you, you have dominion in that area, in that sphere. So if you are in the, if you are in the medical field, you, are, you, you become your best. If you are a business person, you dominate that realm for Jesus. If you are a teacher, you dominate that realm for Jesus. God does not want Christians to be under what does the Bible call you in Matthew chapter 5 verse 16? He said you are the light of where? Your village? The light of where? The light of where? What does that tell you? That means you are a global entity. Tell three people and say, I'm not local, I'm global. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You see, I know those who are really global, I know they will say it. I know some of you are satisfied with a local mentality. With littleness. You know, you know, it's very interesting that this is 2021 and some people's vision is just to have a nice house and two cars. That's the limit. That's the zenith of their vision. Just to be comfortable. So as long as I have a house and I'm paying my mortgage, I'm good. Come on! Tell somebody and say, wake up and smell the coffee. God has something bigger for you than that. Dominion. Alright? So, now remember where I'm coming from. I'm not going to take time. I want to, you know, just, you know, put some things through to you. This 
thing is standing on two legs. Somebody say two legs. What is leg number one? What is leg number two? Leg number one. Leg number two. Number one. Number two. Okay. Now, we like everything that goes with being a king. We want to have dominion, wealth, authority, power, beauty. You want to dominate circumstances. But it's not going to happen until you have your second leg, which is to be a priest. The priest dimension means that you have a relationship and intimacy with God. That is what gives you legitimacy and authority on the earth. Do you understand it now? So back in the days, the priest offered sacrifices to God. Are you getting what I'm saying? He brought what? Sacrifices. Everybody says sacrifices. Are you feeling cold this morning? <laughs> Amen. So the priest brought sacrifices. And you know, while I don't want to you know, take you into a lot of theology, I'll just make it simple that two main sacrifices that the priest brought to God in those days, number one was burnt offerings and number two was incense. The incense represented prayer and the burnt offerings represented praise and thanksgiving unto God. Are you getting this? And the Bible says, if you are going to reign on the earth, you know, some of you want to get to heaven to reign. What are you going to reign over in heaven? Are you going to reign over God or reign over angels? This is where you are going to reign. Where are you going to reign? I said, where are you going to reign? I said, where are you going to reign? This is where you are going to reign. When you dominate the scene, this is where you are going to reign. Are you listening to what I'm saying? How many people here really want to reign? You want to reign. Eh? You want to reign? Huh? You want to reign? You want to reign? How many want to reign? You want to walk in dominion? Walk in power? Walk in victory? Walk in glory? You want to reign? You want to reign over devils and demons? You want to be able to subdue situations and circumstances? So when they say that, oh, this is not possible, you say, not for me, I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm born to reign. Uh -huh, I like that. Amen. Now, if you really want to reign, then you must have your other leg on the ground, which is to be a priest unto God. And to offer sacrifices of praise. So see, this is the reason why many, many children of God are not reigning. Let's look at Jesus. Matthew chapter 15. And let's look at verse 32. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Now Jesus was in the wilderness one day, and he confronted a situation. And um, Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, not 22, 32. 3, 2. Matthew 15, 32, 3, 2. Now the Bible said, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and they have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting so that they don't faint in the way. Next verse. And his disciples said to him, where should we have so much bread? In this wilderness. This is a wilderness. Where are we going to get bread? To fill so great a multitude. How am I going to have the means. To take care of all the problems that I have. So maybe you need a thousand. But here you are. You have a hundred. I'm just using that as an example. Where are you going to have so much bread? In the wilderness. Do you have bakeries in the wilderness? No, bakeries are in the city. But here was Jesus in the wilderness. Now look at what Jesus said. Verse 34. And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? 
God always starts with what you have. How many loaves do you have? And they said what? Seven. And a few little fishes. Everybody says seven. And few little fishes. Let me tell you something. Don't despise the little that you have. Don't disregard it. Don't despise it. A lot of people despise their days of small beginnings or the little that they have. Don't despise it. Because that's where God is going to start from. He said, seven and few little fishes. Now let's see what Jesus did. Verse 35. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. Because if he doesn't make them sit down, there's going to be chaos. And God is not the author of confusion. I find out that one of the three things that create problems, food is one of them. Don't ask me the remaining two. But out of three main things that create problems, food is one of them. How many of you agree with me? And so, Jesus said, sit down. I want you to know that God is a God of order. And if God is going to bless your life, you have to have order in your life. A lot of people are disorderly. And they expect the blessings of God. Jesus said, make the people sit down. And then look at what he did. Next verse. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and did what? And gave thanks. He gave thanks. Somebody, can you lift your right hand to heaven? Say, Father, thank you for the little that I have. Thank you for the few dollars in my bank account. In the name of Jesus. Put down your hands. He said he gave thanks and then he gave it to his disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitude. And then what happened? In verse 37, the Bible said, And they did all eat after Jesus gave thanks. Now, you would think that when Jesus gave thanks, it's just like they just handed over the seven loaves to them and just said, Father, thank you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you know? And just said something, just mumbled something in two minutes and, you know, and then he gave it to the disciples and they, you know, started to distribute to everybody else. No, it wasn't like that. I want you to understand that Jesus' lifestyle was a lifestyle of thanksgiving. This is the picture of who Jesus is in private. This is his private life. His private life was a life given to thanksgiving, worship, praise, not complaining, not murmuring. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? A life of, of giving thanks always. Even for seven loaves and few fishes. Even for little things and little blessings. What do you do when you ask God for healing for your physical body. And then you find out that the pain reduced. And if they ask you and say, what is the level of pain from 0 to 10? 0 being the lowest and 10 being the highest. You said, mm, it's like 3 now. I'm not quite there yet. Can you thank God for that 3? Or are you going to say, I wasn't healed? One day, Elijah was praying for rain and praying for rain. He had been praying for 18 hours. After praying for 18 hours, he told his servant, go and check. Is something happening? And the Bible said, the servant went, came back. He said, there's nothing. He kept sending him back. Every few hours, he sent him back. After about 18 hours, the Bible said the servant went and the servant came back with a report. He said, there is a cloud appearing, but the cloud is so small. It's just the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, yes, that is it. That's what we need. Go and tell the king, rain is coming. He said, but it's only a little cloud. If you don't know how to thank God for the little cloud, you can't see a deluge. People who don't know how to thank God for his finger never see his hand. And those who don't know how to thank God for his hand never see his outstretched hand. If you learn to give thanks to God for the little, then it's going to graduate to much. The Bible said they all ate and were filled through thanksgiving. And they took of the broken meat that, that was left seven baskets full. <laughs> so they ate, they were filled, 
and they had left over now that is the kind of blessing that god is giving to you today and giving to you this month in the name of jesus christ let me tell you i'm telling you what to do not only when you are inside the church when we are inside the church you know you can mumble some praise and mumble some thanks but do you live a life of thanksgiving every day every hour every minute i'll tell you four things that thanksgiving will do for you number one thanksgiving will multiply your blessings thanksgiving is a multiplier everybody say with me say thanksgiving is a multiplier you see that now can we can you give us john chapter 6 and verse 23 let's look at this i'm looking at somebody this morning in the month of june your blessings will multiply somebody lift your two hands to heaven and say father multiply me in the name of jesus what is multiply if you have 10 and it's multiplied how much is that is it going to be huh if you have 10 and God multiplies your 10, what is it going to be? Huh? Huh? 100. If you have 100 and it's multiplied, what does it become? <laughs> oh my God. What did you score in mathematics? <laughs> All right. Multiply. Okay. Let's look at John chapter 6 verse 23. John 6 23 and I want us to go through this and then we're going to practicalize this scripture now let's all read this together everybody want to go how did there came other boats from Tiberias near unto the place where where they did what they did what uh-huh they ate bread when they had bread when everyone say after Say, say it again. Say, after. When did they eat bread? When did they eat bread? Now, after what? When will you eat bread? After you have given thanks. You know, some people want to eat bread first. Then they say, thank you, Jesus. But no, you are not going to eat bread like that. They ate bread. After the Lord had given thanks. The Lord gave thanks first and then the supplies came. Now, don't tell me you can't do that. Don't tell me you can't do that. Don't tell me that you can't give thanks in your down moments. Thanksgiving is a choice. You can choose to live a life of thanksgiving or a life of complaining. The power of God will come upon you today so that you live a life of perpetual thanksgiving. Somebody say, Father, thank you because all my needs are met in the name of Jesus. Listen, have you ever locked up yourself for two to three hours just to give thanks to God and praise him? Have you ever said to yourself, I'm not going to pray about this matter. I won't bind any demon. I'll just give thanks. You can try it this week. He said, what am I supposed to do? Play some nice songs on your phone and dance. If you have a doctor's report, put it on the floor. Dance around it. Anything that's a concern to you, dance around it. Is somebody listening to what I'm saying? The Bible said, they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. The little that they had multiplied after God gave thanks. After Jesus gave thanks, sorry. To God. After I give thanks to God. Can you lift your hands to heaven and say, Father, thank you in the name of Jesus. I'm grateful to you, Lord. I give you thanks. 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 In the name of Jesus. That is what to do consistently on a regular. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Let it be part of your life. You are driving to work. You are giving thanks. Do you know what Jesus did when he got to the tomb of Lazarus? Before Jesus ever called Lazarus to come out of the grave. He didn't get to Lazarus' grave and say, I bind the spirit of death. No. What, what did he do? John chapter 11 verse 41. John 11 41. The Bible says, can you give it to us? John eleven forty one. 41. The Bible tells us. 
They took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Can we read on? Let's read one to go. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard. This was before he even prayed. I thank you that you have heard me. No wonder the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians chapter 4, I believe verse 6, it says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. You start your prayers with thanksgiving. You wrap thanksgiving around it. You hand it with thanksgiving. That's how you do it. Thanksgiving is a multiplier. Number two, thanksgiving sanctifies. Thanksgiving is a sanctifier. Thanksgiving cleanses and purifies, dedicates and consecrates. God cannot touch any problem until it is sanctified. How do you sanctify it? First Timothy chapter 4 verse, let's look at verse, um, verse 3. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 3. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 3. Uh, let's take it from verse 4 for time's sake. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Why? Verse 5 says, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So when you give thanks for something, whatever it is, no matter how bad the situation is, in, like Jesus stood before, you know, the tomb of Lazarus. And he said, Father, thank you. As he gave thanks, the hand of God could be released. Because thanksgiving sanctifies. Until that situation is sanctified, God cannot get involved with it. And what gets God involved is your thanksgiving. What sanctifies it is your thanksgiving. The Bible said it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So that's why we give thanks for our food. I hope you don't eat without giving thanks for your food. How many of you just grab it and start digging into it without giving thanks? When you take your food, you have to give thanks. You have to say, Father, thank you. When you do that, all the poisons and toxins are removed. Did you know that in Matthew 26, 27 to, verse 27 to 28, Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 to 28, Jesus Christ, when he was at the, at the Passover table, the Bible said he took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. He gave thanks for it. And then he gave it to his disciples. Jesus was giving thanks for his blood that was about to be shed. When was the last time you gave thanks for your blood? When was the last time you gave thanks for your heart? When was the last time you gave thanks to God for your lungs, for your kidneys, for your pancreas, for your bones, for your eyes, for your ears? When was the last time you said, Father, thank you for my eyes and for my ears? If you know the kind of sicknesses that go on in this world, you will learn to give thanks to God more. And you will know that it's just by the mercy of God that you are not consumed. Somebody say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you open your mouth and thank God right now for your physical body? Thank God for your, for your health. Thank God for your body. Thank God for your legs. Thank God for your back. Thank God for your eyes. Thank God for your ears. Thank God for your nose. Thank God for every organs in your body. Open your mouth and say, Father, I give you thanks. I give you thanks. I give you thanks. Hallelujah. Amen. Number three, thanksgiving is an opener. Thanksgiving opens things up. Psalm 67, verse 5 to 7. Psalm 67, verse 5 to 7. The Bible said, can you put it on the board? Psalm 67, verse 5 to 7. The Bible said, let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield an increase when the people praise you then then shall the earth open up he said and god even our own god shall bless us every time you raise the altar of thanksgiving unto god you provoke 
divine blessings. Today, may the spirit of murmuring and complaining leave you forever. He said in verse 7, God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Are you ready for a fearful blessing? Are you ready for God to give you a blessing that will make people afraid? He said the earth will yield an increase. I'm praying this morning that as we begin to give thanks to God, things will open up in your life. Thanksgiving is an opener. It opens things up. Your life can open up. Are you getting what I'm saying? There are potentials there in you, but it's only through Thanksgiving that they open up. Thanksgiving opens things up. Now, one of the things that Thanksgiving opens you up to is that it opens you up to the favor of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. Put it on the board quickly. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. The Bible said concerning the early church, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Do you see that? Everybody say with me. Say praising God. And having favor. So you are, you are saying now that, you see, in order for this leg to work, to be a king, to have dominion, to rule and reign on earth, you must have this leg planted. You must be a priest that is ministering to God, that is giving thanks to God, that is giving worship to God. Are you get what I'm saying? It's very, very important. Every child of God is called to do that. You are called to minister to God. You are called to worship him. You are called to praise him. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Today, I pray that the favor of God will be released upon your life as you praise him in Jesus' name. Do you know that the more you praise God, the more you can have favor? And I'm telling you, the favor of God will do for you what you can't do for yourself for years. Favor can give you in one day the blessing of 10 years. The favor of God. Somebody shout, I receive favor. In the name of Jesus. Say that one more time. Say, I receive favor. You need favor. Favor, 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 favor. But how does favor come? Praising God and having favor. Praising God and having favor. And then finally this morning, Thanksgiving is a strengthener. So remember the first one. What's the first one? Thanksgiving is what? A multiplier. What's the second one? Sanctify. What's the third one? What's the fourth one? Strengthen. Thanksgiving strengthens you. Romans chapter 4 verse 20. Romans chapter 4 verse 20. The Bible said about, about Abraham in Romans 4 20 that Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. But he was strong in faith. Giving glory to God. Hallelujah. Abraham was strong in faith. He was strong in faith as he gave glory to God. You see, as you give glory to God and as you worship and thank him, your faith is strengthened. That's one of the things that Thanksgiving does. It strengthens your faith. The more intimate you are with God, praising him, thanking him, worshiping him, because he is good and his mercy and the earth forever. The more you do that, the more your faith is strengthened. Hallelujah. How many of you know that God is a good God? Listen, how many of you have ever told God your secret and you had it somewhere? Eh? Anybody here? You ever told God your secret and then you had it from somebody? And then <laughs> the person came to you and said, God was in my room last night. Everything you were saying. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now, even if God tells somebody, I mean, there have been times when God will reveal things to, you know, to someone. You understand? You know, it's, it's one of the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. But you see, the person that is saying this is not braggadocious about it. He's not abrasive about it. He's very humble and genuine about it. And doesn't go spreading it around. How many of you have someone that you can call on any time of the day? You have a friend like that, that you can call them 2 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning. Raise up your hand. Great. You have it. How many of you have a friend that will be with you 24-7, 365 days of the year? That will be with you, like be with you, like I'm, <laughs> like be by your side. When you are going to work, they follow you. You are going to the toilet, they follow you. 
How many of you have a friend like that? Eh? You, you have a... Eh? You see now? Now, the thing is this. When you think about the goodness of God, and you think about His mercies, you see, there are many things that you will not understand on this earth until you get to heaven. Immediately, I've said it before, immediately you get to heaven and you see Jesus, life will make sense. Immediately, you won't need to ask questions. So you say, when I get to heaven now, we ask Jesus many, many questions. And we ask him, no, no, no. You won't need to. When you see him, life will make sense. You will now say, ah, I now know why. I now know why. Let me tell you something. You will not know the zenith, the measure, the full measure of the goodness of God until you see God. God is so good. God cares even for people who don't believe in him. People who deny his existence. He cares for them. And he cares for them in miraculous ways. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of you don't know the reason why God planted you in the family where you are. It is to help somebody and you don't know. Because of someone. There are, there are things that God will do for you. And do that will really amaze you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes God can make somebody to marry into a family or marry a person just because he wants to do something for that person. That's the only, that's the only way you can explain it. There are many people who would have died if not for the family they are in. Yeah. The goodness of God is beyond estimation. God is a good God. Somebody say, God is a good God. Oh, God is good and his mercies endures forever. Only someone that can reason will be able to know the mercies and the goodness of God. The Bible said concerning Abraham that Abraham did not stagger the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith as he gave glory to God. Your faith can be stronger today than it was yesterday. Through thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Do you know the reason why Abraham was able to sacrifice Isaac? God told him, take your son, your only son, and go and sacrifice him. Now, that was a child he waited for for 25 years. The closest to it today is God telling you and say, take your whole salary and go and put it on the altar. Look at the way some of you shouted. Say, eh! What about the man that God said, take your only son? Now, and the place where God told him to sacrifice was three days journey. 72 hours. So the guy had three days to change his mind. And with every step he was taking, something was telling him, are you, are you crazy? Are you sure you want to do this? Remember, you waited for this child for 25 years. Are you going to give him up just like that? You know why Abraham could go to Mount Moriah? And why he could attempt to sacrifice the boy? Because Abraham believed that God can raise him up. He had that faith. Abraham believed that if I put a knife to the neck of this boy, God will raise him back to life. Now, that is faith. Come on, talk to me somebody. I said, that is faith. How did Abraham get that faith? The Bible said, by giving glory to God. Somebody open your mouth and say, Father, I give you the glory. That's how he got it. By a life of thanksgiving and praise. You say, I didn't know that Abraham praised God. Oh, you didn't read your Bible very well. Many times when the Bible said Abraham raised an altar to God, what was he doing? It was an altar of thanksgiving and praise unto God. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. There are three people here today. The Spirit of God is telling me to tell you. He said, Go ahead and do a big thanksgiving before what you are expecting comes. And what you are expecting will come. As I said that word, it will resonate with your spirit. He said, go ahead, do thanksgiving. Just come and say, I want to do thanksgiving. He yeah. said, and what you expect will show up. Abraham was strong in faith by giving glory to God. Let's read the last scripture. No wonder the Bible tells us this last scripture we are reading. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse, 5 verse 18. He said, in 
everything. First Thessalonians 5 18. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. He said, In everything give thanks. In how many things? Come on, talk to me. In how many things? What is the definition of everything? Everything. Give thanks. Now, you may not be able to give thanks for everything. But in everything, the first thing you do is thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. Some, somebody say, oh, I want to know the will of God. What is the will of God for my life? This is the will of God. In everything, give thanks. Then look at the next verse, verse 19. He said, quench not the spirit. What does that mean? It means this, if you don't give thanks and live a lifestyle of thanksgiving, you are going to stifle and extinguish the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you wonder many times why you feel dry spiritually? Why you can't pray? Why you open your mouth and it's very heavy? It's because you've not been thanking God. You've not been in thanksgiving. But let me tell you something. Thanksgiving aerates your spirit. As you give thanks to God, your spirit becomes loose, released, fluid. Are you, are you listening to this? You just find out that there's that flow. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. It dwells in that atmosphere. Now, if you don't create that atmosphere of thanksgiving, you are going to quench the spirit. You, you're going to quench the spirit. You are going to stifle the Holy Spirit. You are going to extinguish him. You are going to suppress the divine influences in your life. So these are the things that thanksgiving does for you. What's the first one again? What's the second one? What's the third one? What's the fourth one? M-S-O-S. -S. Rise on your feet.